Welcome to Faith Anglican Church here in Cordova, Tennessee. I'm Father Ross Guthrie. I'm filling in for Father Herb Hand, and I'll be telling you all about that a little bit later. But for now, welcome. Uh, what a great day to gather together once again in the spirit of the Lord to worship our Lord uh, on this day that we um, are focusing on the epiphany, the manifestation, the revelation of Jesus Christ to us all. Uh, so welcome.
This has been a long year. A year of uncertainty, struggle, pain. We've watched a virus take countless lives. People we knew, people we loved. Jobs have been lost. Businesses have shut down. And churches have been forced to close their doors. We've witnessed division on an unprecedented level. Cities filled with violence. Streets filled with protesters. And we felt the sting of racism. The deep heartache of hate. There have been times where it's been difficult to see the hand of God. But even in the darkest of moments, He has been there, faithful, present, powerful. As a new year begins, we stand on a simple truth. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll soar on wings as eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not grow faint. We don't know what this new year will hold, but we know that it's held by a God whose mercies are new every morning. This is where we place our trust. This is the truth on which we stand. This is our hope for the new year.
will acclaim with me. I will make you as a light to the nations. Let us pray this together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and glorify you through Christ our Lord. Amen. We'll hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, by the leading of a star, you manifested your only Son to the peoples of the earth. Lead us, who know you now by faith, to your presence, where we may see your glory face to face. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please read responsibly the whole verse. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people, and the hills in righteousness. May they fear you while the sun endures, and as long as the moon, throughout all generations. May you be like the rain that falls on the long grass, like showers of water on the earth. In his days, may the righteous flourish, and the peace abound, till the moon be no more. May you not have the to sea to sea, and from the river. May desert tribes bow down before him, and his enemies lick the dust. May the kingdoms of Tarshish and of the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba say, Father, bring him. May all kings fall down before him, all nations serve him. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promises in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, <clears throat> this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers 
and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he real has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will, be, who, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, and I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them, until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Well, let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks for our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. We give you thanks for his birth, for his incarnation, that God became man in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we give you thanks for this hope in our lives and pray that you give us uh, the same joy, Lord, to be able to spread to the to the nations around us, the people around us, our culture that desperately needs uh, love uh, and to know you, Lord, as we know you. I uh, pray that you bless this time now uh, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Well, I'm Father Ross Guthrie. I'm, uh, oddly enough to say, I am from North Augusta, South Carolina. Still getting used to that. Uh, I've been there since 2019. Prior to that, I was, I lived uh, over for over 30 years in Jackson, Tennessee. I raised a, a large family there. My wife and I are high school sweethearts. We've been married for uh, 32 years, and we have 10 children. Um, eight daughters and uh, two sons. Most of the time I tell people I have ten children and they gasp. And then I tell them I have eight daughters and the gasp is even louder. <laughs> uh, happy to see one of my daughters here this morning. It's great. She uh, lives here in, in Memphis and her husband. Um, I'm covering for Father Herb today. Uh, I know Herb's had a rough fall with uh, surgery on, on his... Uh, <coughs> throat and having all the issues with speaking and uh, Father Herb was so, he was so good to me uh, in, in becoming a priest. I became a priest in 2016 after a uh, lengthy uh, pastoral life in a non-denominational church and 
had that Anglican pull for a long, long time. I wanted, I wanted to be an Anglican priest about at least a decade before I could actually make the journey. And so um, Father Herb was instrumental for me in becoming a priest to be able to come here and, and cover for him and do some things in my formation as an Anglican priest was super helpful. So I thought with Father Herb's uh, difficult fall, I thought I'm gonna be in this week. If you want me to cover for you, I'd love to. And, and he took me up, for, up on it. So I'm glad to be with you all this morning. I uh, am all the, you know, there's all kinds of little customs and different, uh, you know, it is Anglican worship. So we're all used to worshiping in a similar way, but there's some little things here and there. Um, and uh, I'm really, I, I told our acolyte this morning, everybody thinks the priest is in charge, but we simply follow the acolyte. Uh, uh, so she uh, bailed me out just a second ago, letting me know you need to read the gospel. So that was very helpful as well. Well, throughout the last month of December, prior to Christmas Day here in the Anglican way, we were in the season of Advent. Advent prepared us for the coming of Jesus. In the Christmas season, which we're currently in, we continue to celebrate his incarnation. In the birth of Jesus, the word of God became flesh. That's the focus of these 12 days after Christmas Day as we celebrate the season of Christmas. Every year on January the 6th, we celebrate the day of Epiphany. In the early life of the church and to the, this day among the Eastern Orthodox, January 6th is the feast of the Incarnation or Christmas Day. But for various reasons, for us in the Western world, January 6th has become the fixed date for the feast of the Epiphany. On this Sunday, we're focusing on the Feast of the Epiphany because at least it will be celebrated on this coming Thursday as we are gathered uh, together today here on, on this Sunday. I think it's a good, uh, good time to rem you know, remind ourselves of the upcoming Holy Day as we celebrate the life of our Lord Jesus uh, Christ in the, in the church's calendar. Now the word epiphany comes from the Greek word epiphaneia, which means appearance. Another similar Greek word means, uh, or another similar Greek word, epiphanane, means to show forth or to manifest. So this great feast of the epiphany is the celebration of God the Father revealing God the Son in the person of Jesus Christ to all the world as our Savior and the forgiveness of our sins. The whole Bible really is about the manifestation or revelation of God himself to his creation, and particularly mankind. He sent us his son, the word made flesh, to make himself known to us and so that we might know him. The whole purpose of mankind, the whole purpose of each of us is to know God and to be known by him. Our purpose is to be loved by God and to return that love back to him. In that love we are to love one another and others in the world as he first loved us. The great feast of Epiphany is the revelation of God's love to us in his son, Jesus Christ. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's from Colossians 1. Our great God is a mystery in his nature. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God in three persons. How are we to possibly understand who he is unless he reveals himself to us? In the Apostle John's first letter to a particular church in his day, he writes that God is love. God is, in fact, an eternal exchange of love in the communion of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It is his very nature of love that leads him to expand this communion of love and extend his love to each of us. He reveals himself to us through the person of his son, Jesus Christ. The whole Bible is the account of this revelation in which God reveals himself to all of mankind through his beloved son, Jesus Christ. St. Matthew writes in his memoir of Jesus that God began revealing his beloved son in the world in the small town of Bethlehem. 
St. Matthew writes, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Matthew said that Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. King Herod was a brilliant city planner, wonderfully prosperous in business, and extraordinarily evil. I'm not exaggerating when I say that this King Herod was a monster. He was a half-Jew at best, and it was the Roman government who put him in charge of the country of Judea. The great storyteller Josephus said that he had his wife's grandfather and brother executed because they'd become too popular among the people. A few years later, he executed his wife and her mother at the same time. A few years after that, he had two of his sons executed because they'd been accused by another son of plotting his death. And later on, he had that son killed. And on and on it went. The nature of King Herod's reign in Judah in Judea was tyranny. So what do you think his reaction was when some magi from the land of sunrise came to Jerusalem and asked, where is he who's been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and come to worship him. Well, I'll tell you the way St. Matthew told it. He said that when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Herod's entire reign as king of Judea was characterized by a fierce jealousy and paranoia. He put to death anybody who became a threat to his throne and his way of life. And now here in his old age, magi from the land of sunrise had come to worship a newborn king of the Jews. He was troubled to say the least. And when he was troubled, the whole city became troubled. They knew what he was like. If he was troubled, they knew that they'd feel it somehow. And he had good reason to be upset, I suppose. I mean, when do magi from the land of sunrise come to your city looking for a newborn king? What did they know that he didn't know? St. Matthew wrote down in the Greek language that these visitors to Jerusalem were magoi. Magus is a word that can mean about four different things. And the worst kind of meaning is that Magus is a deceiving and a lying magician. In the Acts of the Apostles, when Paul sailed to the island of Paphos, a Magus, or a sorcerer named Bar-Jesus, uh, tried to keep a leader of the island from hearing Paul and Barnabas' preaching of Jesus. Paul called him a son of the devil and an enemy of righteousness. And then Paul called down a curse on him. And the Holy Spirit blinded that magus or that sorcerer for a time. And the leader of the island believed in Jesus. Now these magi from the land of sunrise were not like that deceiving magus. These magi were wise men. They're from the land of sunrise or from the east. It's hard to know exactly where they're from other than the east. All kinds of places are, are mentioned in Holy Scripture. You heard a some of them earlier in our readings and from praying our psalm. Uh, places like Tarshish and the Isles of Sheba and Seba. It's also possible that they were from Babylon in Persia where the Israelites were once exiled uh, to when they were conquered by the Babylonians. Now wherever they came from, most everyone agrees that they were Magoi or wise men. They were the keepers of religious teaching and philosophical knowledge in their region. These Magoi weren't deceiving liars and magicians. They were Gentile philosophers who studied nature and held religious beliefs based on their knowledge of nature. They studied the earth and the stars in their study of God. So like any of us, they learned some things about God from nature. But like all of us, what they needed was God, God's revelation of himself. And that only comes through his revelation of his beloved son. Jesus Christ. Only an epiphany could lead them to a true knowledge of God the Creator. Like us, only a manifestation of Jesus Christ would lead them to the forgiveness of their sins and eternal life. They had left their home in the land of sunrise because a certain star had appeared in the sky. And that's another whole other story in itself. There was a pagan prophet named Balaam 
You might have read about him in the book of Numbers. These magi from the east may have read the same book of Numbers from when the Israelites had brought the Hebrew scriptures with them to Babylon. Or it may be that a prophecy that this pagan prophet had spoken created a buzz in other pagan areas. And these wise men had the prophecy handed down to them just like our Old Testament prophecies are handed down to us. However, these magi learned of it. The pagan Balaam's prophecy went like this. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. That's from Numbers 24, 17. In that prophecy, the star was a person, a leader coming out of the family of Jacob in Israel. These magi discerned that a king would rise out of Israel that would rule the nations. They studied and watched the stars, hoping to find some clues to when this star, this king, would be born in Israel. And by a miracle, a unique star appeared that they assumed was connected to that ancient prophecy. So what does it take for these wise and, and learned men to pack their camels with necessities and provisions and gifts and to set out on a long journey that could take months, all because a certain star appeared in the sky? What made them so sure that this star was a message to them? Have you ever got a message from the other side, so to speak? Have you ever wondered if a dream actually meant something? But God himself may have given it to you like a, he gave a dream to Joseph or Daniel or, or the Apostle Peter. Have you ever read a verse with, in a passage of Holy Scripture and felt like it was the Holy Spirit speaking directly to you? Have you ever prayed for something and it actually come to pass and then be left wondering if it was really all a coincidence? I have. I've experienced all of that. I bet many of you have as well. We didn't have those experiences because we were great and self-important. It was a work of grace in my life and in your life as well. And so at the same time, don't think you're insignificant or too small for such things. I want to remind you that St. Matthew started the telling of this event with the Magi and Herod and the Holy Family's flight to Egypt with these words. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Beloved, there's nothing particularly significant about Bethlehem in and of itself. It was a tiny little town just south of Jerusalem and had very little going for it. However, the chief priests and the scribes of the Jewish people let King Herod know that it was in Bethlehem that their savior, their future king of the Jews, was to be born. So said the prophet Micah, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. It's Micah 5. Bethlehem was a tiny little backwater town. And yet Beth Bethlehem is the place that a savior of the people of God would come from. Bethlehem is a place of calling. Because when God calls a place, or when God calls a person to a task, then it becomes significant for God's purposes. Tiny and insignificant Bethlehem in truth is a royal city. Its one claim to fame, if you remember, was that it was there that Samuel the prophet anointed David to be the king of Israel. David, the last born of eight brothers and from a shepherding family, a working class family, from the smallest clan of Judah. God had turned to the smallest of the clans of Judah. And from that clan, he took the youngest. And God called him to be the king of Israel. Beloved, God does not call people for his purposes because of who they are or because of what they've done. God calls people out of grace. He asks us to do something or to speak something, and it does not matter how insignificant we are or how small we are. What matters is how great our God is and how he delights to show himself strong in, weakness. in his wonderful book on living our lives with one another in Christ called Life Together, Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes, What may appear weak and trifling to us may be great and glorious to God. And this is what happens for Bethlehem. And it can happen for each of us as well. 
Notice once again the situation with Herod's court theologians. When asked where the Savior of the Jews would be born, they quote Micah the prophet. They sort of quote Micah the prophet. Micah prophesied, but you at Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. That's how it reads in Micah. But that's not how the chief priests and the scribes quoted it to Herod. They say, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. So what are we to make of that? Well, I'll close with this. When God chooses a place or a person according to his purposes, beloved, that changes everything. God changed a backwoods little town into a royal city. God turned an insignificant working class shepherd boy into the king of Israel. And here in our worship of Jesus, God became incarnate, enfleshed. God became one of us. And when he did, he entered the world through a teenaged young lady with no significance. In a tiny, obscure town, born into a working class family. When God chooses a place or calls a person according to his purposes and for his purposes, then all that matters is that we respond by faith and his grace will be sufficient for whatever needs to be done or said. On this Sunday, as we prepare for the feast day of Epiphany, I pray that God continues to manifest his greatness to each of you. I pray that God will manifest himself through you to others in your life who need the hope of Jesus and the forgiveness of sins and eternal life in his name. If you feel small and insignificant, overlooked or forgotten, a bit aimless or in a time of waiting, then you are exactly the type of person that God calls for his purpose. Pay attention to your dreams at night. Pay attention to your prayers in the day. Pay attention to your readings of Holy Scripture. And listen for the voice of our great God. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. May God stir us all up in this season of our lives, during this ongoing pandemic, during this chaotic time in our country's culture, during this moment in time in which the hearts of people are being prepared for the revelation of Jesus Christ. May God use me, may God use each of you to pronounce the good news of Jesus' birth and life and death and resurrection and ascension as the only hope of the forgiveness of sins and eternal life and love of God. We are small and insignificant. Our God is great and all-powerful in his glory. So glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation in the, to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. As you're standing with me, let's confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, 
We believe in one holy, catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And here you may be seated or kneel as I... Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, Hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world, and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, for Foley, our Archbishop, and Frank, our Assisting Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. for all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. For our brothers and sisters in Christ, who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy, for our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially for Joe, our president. Lord, in your mercy, for all those who are in trouble, sickness, or any other adversity, especially Mansell, Nancy, Bill, John, Eli, Janie Beth, Jonathan, Larry, Davis, and Wes. Lord, in your mercy, for all those who departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, in our diocesan cycle of prayer, we put pray for the people and clergy of Holy Family, Hendersonville, Tennessee, asking you, Lord, to bless and strengthen their ministry and fellowship to be good witnesses for Jesus Christ. Please join me in the prayer for mission. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Amen. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will, walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. 
Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Well, please stand with me. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. And with your spirit. Take a moment and greet one another with the peace of Christ. As you make your way back to your seats, uh, we do have a few announcements uh, for you. Um, just uh, my observation as well that this is much like our parish in North Augusta, South Carolina, that uh, the passing of the peace almost deteriorates completely into, uh, to, into fellowship. <laughs> so it's nice to see uh, the warmth of this parish. This is, this is great. I love it. Um, but this is a time for us just to draw some attention to um, some announcements. Um, and since I'm visiting priests this morning, there's no way I'm going to know these announcements. I'll turn it over. <laughs> so I, I think to start off, thank you, Father Guthrie, for being with us today. Um, and your daughter. So um, and I'd also like to congratulate Daryl. He's now our music minister. <laughs> So that's good news for us. Um, the other major announcement we have is these beautiful poinsettias need to go to their rightful owners. So if you bought some, please grab. Um, if there's some left over next week, I'm sure no one will mind if you take them home, even if you didn't make a purchase. But go ahead and do that. And I think that's all except that today is Testimony Sunday. And so if people have a testimony they would like to share, please feel free to come up. Thank you. Um, excuse me. Um, like Father Guthrie, um, I too have felt the Anglican pull for years. Well, about three years, um, and uh, I did not know that the gospel was for believers. I, in the past, I thought um, the gospel was for those poor saps who who uh, didn't know God like I did. Uh, 
I was uh, a morally restrained hypocrite, um, and um, and it showed. And I I hid from God in in uh, my righteousness, my my self righteousness, um, and it manifested itself in uh, my marriage, uh, all my relationships. Um, and God has a way of breaking us down. <clears throat> He'll do whatever it takes to, to remove the obstacles in, in the way of him and us. And uh, I believe if we belong to him, uh, he will do anything and everything to, to get to you. He is the hound of heaven. And <clears throat> now that I understand that the gospel is for me, I'm beginning to see that it's a more, it, it, that it's a fire, that it's, it's a multifaceted, I mean, it's, it's an infinite fire, and it's slowly changing me, and uh, uh, I still repent like I breathe uh, air. Uh, I'm finding out, I'm seeing more sin, <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, more value in these liturgical services. And uh, I want to thank you for the people that you are. Uh, and um, I loved visiting here today. Thank you. continue in our worship together with uh, Holy Communion. Um, again, this is just a, an invitation to you all. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've been baptized into his name, um, you're welcome. The Anglican table is an open table, so not the Anglican. Um, but uh, we just encourage you to come forward. If for whatever reason, um, you don't want to take uh, communion with us this morning, but would like to have a blessing, you can just come forward and Simply cross your arms and I'll offer you a, a blessing in that way. So ascribe to the Lord the honor to his name and bring offerings when we come to his cross.
There's a Lord is the glory and the majesty of the Lord. We pray that you would bless these offerings to your glory. Continue to prosper your people that we might be generous as you are generous to the world, Lord. And continue to bear up this church, Lord, as a proclamation of the gospel. And uh, just continue to provide for them all that they need to bear your gospel to the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who took on our mortal flesh to reveal his glory, that he might bring us out of darkness and into his own. Glorious life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. after supper Jesus took the cup and when he given thanks he gave to them saying drink this all of you this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many the forgiveness of sins whenever you drink it do this in remembrance of me therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O oh Father, in this sacrifice, praise, and thanksgiving. And we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit. 
to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also, that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, so that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection unto your Christ, and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into the church, but deliver us from evil, for thine is kingdom, and power, and glory. Hallelujah, Christ our Passover, lamb has been sacrificed for us once for all on the cross. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Hallelujah. And the gifts of God, for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith. With thanksgiving.
Well, let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, uh, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. And I pray that you receive this blessing. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.